Okay, dear Dhamma friends, so hope you can hear me. And uh, we are discussing uh, Kagga Visana Sutta as our theme for the Dhamma sermon. And uh, Kagga Visana Sutta is available in Sutta Nipata, which is available in the Kuddaka Nikaya. And uh, basically, this is preached to Venerable Ananda by the Buddha. And the commentators mentioned that this is basically uh, containing several verses, many verses actually. And each one is a kind of a reason for a previous Pacheka Buddha to attain the full enlightenment. So as you know, there are three stages in the, or we can say kind of three varieties in a way. So the Pacheka Buddha is in the middle. So Samma Sambuddha is the fully enlightened Buddha who is through his knowledge, he attained the Buddhahood and is capable of preaching the Dhamma so that many others also attain the same amount of uh, clarification or they are also able to attain the enlightenment by following the path preached by the Samma Sambuddha. And the Pacheka Buddha also self-enlightened but he is not capable of preaching Dhamma to the level that someone else is capable of understanding it. So to become enlightened. So to that amount, uh, preaching is not available with the Pacheka Buddha. And the other ones are called the Savaka Buddha, that is the disciples of the Samma Sambuddha. So they actually listen Dhamma from the Samma Sambuddha and then uh, they practice themselves. And also some are capable of preaching others so that others also are able to uh, realize the Dhamma. So these are the three kinds of uh, attainments or the Buddhahood that they mentioned in the Dhamma. Now these verses are attributed to the Pacheka Buddhas who privately, due to some reason, they attain full enlightenment. Full enlightenment. So we have discussed uh, several verses so far and today I hope to discuss the uh, next verse and this is going like this. Migo aranyam hi yatha abaddo yeni chakam gachati gocharaya vinyu naro seritang pekhamano eko chare kagga visana kapu. So if we translate it to English, it goes like this As a deer unbound in the forest goes off to grace wherever it wants. So a wise person looking out for freedom should live alone like a rhinoceros horn. So this is the theme of another Pacheka Buddha who attained full enlightenment. So this story is actually comes in the uh, commentary, commentary to the Sutta Nipata. And there are, there is one, one king and uh, he actually get to know about one of another Pacheka Buddha and uh, this particular king thought that Pacheka Buddha is little not happy with him. He basically presumed that particular Pacheka Buddha is not happy with him. He is somewhat angry with him and he want to clarify that doubt. So what he did was he is going along, sorry, going with his uh, army, all his companions to the Pacheka Buddha's, uh, say what we can call, to the monastery. So as he approached the monastery that that residing Pacheka Buddha understood that this particular uh, king is approaching him. So what he did was he sort of uh, clear the garden, clean the garden and he cleaned the walking path and he cleaned the temple. And uh, again, he kept some steps in the walking path. So that when the king approaches, he can recognize where he is, where this Pacheka Buddha resides. So and then again, he kept few steps so that the king may be able to recognize where he is going to reside. Now what happens, now as the king approaches with his, uh, the great army to the monastery, so he felt that I better go alone rather than with these many people so I should at least now go alone because everywhere when I am going with this retinue, all these armies, so 
so i feel little disturbed i feel that i am little burdened let me go alone so this a kind of a feeling came to the uh, king's mind because as you know even today say whenever someone is holding a very high position he is not sometimes going alone he has maybe his bodyguards he has a lot of his companions ministers and so many people are around him so he can't dwell alone he can't go any other place alone so that is kind of a problem that a higher ranking person is having so this king now little understood that and he felt so let me go alone to meet this pacheka buddha now he is going alone to the temple where this pacheka buddha is residing and uh, he recognized the footsteps of the pacheka buddha where he kept in the walking path and through that he understood okay where he is residing and he is now approaching there and uh, once he is there he got inside the temple but he couldn't find out the pacheka buddha but he felt some sort of uh, aloneness some seclusion while being there you know it is a simple dwelling place and there is no any other person there there are no any bodyguards there are no any armies no one is there so for the first time now the king was able to be alone so he now understand there is some sort of a freedom by being alone maintaining seclusion maintaining solitude so there are three categories that buddha mention in the aloneness or the seclusion solitude the first one is called kaya viveka where one is going away from others and having some sort of a solitude no one is bothering you now so you are having your own dwelling there is no one near to you and you are having some sort of a lo- aloneness so this is a kind of a positive atmosphere coming in the mind because sometimes being with the people every time is very difficult so the next verse also telling the same thing we will go to that as well so in this point so this uh, king understood this i am feeling some sort of a freedom by being alone so now he is simply residing at the temple of that particular pacheka buddha now the king is reflecting so there is a freedom by being alone there is no one to bother me so i am like a deer now i can go anywhere i like so i am not bound to anything i am not bound to anyone there is no one coming and asking me to uh, settle a kind of a dispute settle a kind of a rebellion settle a kind of a, any kind of an issue because as you know being a king so he may had lot of responsibilities lot of uh, issues but now while being at the place of that pacheka buddha who he feel fairly comfortable probably you also might have uh, recognized this suppose you are spending a very busy life and time to time suppose you are going to a remote monastery or you are going to a say kind of a forest or you are going to a say uh, some kind of a park garden and you simply sit alone and you feel something uh, comfortable and you feel that you are sort of confident you feel that you are relaxed there is no tension there is no any kind of a uh, burden thinking to attend to in this thing that thing any of those so you feel some sort of a comfortable feeling while being alone so this king also re- recognized it he also appreciated it and that leads him to calm down his mind and that leads him to arouse concentration so his mind become concentrated and using that concentration he was able to uh, develop vipassana and he attained pacheka buddhahood now this king is now the pacheka buddha now his army and the other people came in search of him because they want to go back along with the king and they come and ask let's go to the kingdom let's go to the palace now the king is refusing now he is not a king but he is a pacheka buddha 
and now he is telling i am not going to come with you being with you is a trouble being with you is a burden i don't have any freedom to go alone wherever i like while being with you i reflect at that same thing and that caused me to became or attain pacheka buddhahood so therefore he is mentioning this freedom to go wherever he like is something that uh, uh, he admired he appreciated and using which that he is able to arouse piti rapture in his mind and using which he is able to develop concentration and wisdom and he attain pacheka buddhahood now something similar is available in the uh, other suttas in the certain suttas buddha mention this quality that the monks may enjoy you know certain monks that they don't dwell in a particular monastery or particular temple for long time they do going from one monastery to another monastery and there is a austere practice also called abbok uh, abbokasikanga where one is dwelling in an open ground not associating any kind of a kuti not associating a particular temple staying only one night at a shelter and the next day you are going to another place so likewise is a kind of a solitary practice dutanga practice austere practice certain monks are undertaking and even uh, say even one is spending vassa period at a particular monastery so at the end of the vassa that they leave that place and go into another place so there is another beautiful incident happened during the buddha's time and uh, there were several monks from the magadha and another group of monks from the kosala another group of monks from the vajji so all of them actually settled in a particular forest and they were practicing diligently and the many celestial beings were there and they were quite happy by looking at these uh, diligent monks they are with uh, good companionship and they are practicing well and now they reach the end of the vassa and at the end of the vassa they all have gone now the next day a one celestial being a deva he notice empty huts empty dwelling place no monks are there now he felt little unhappy because he actually was quite happy seeing these diligent monks and he is now a little sad seeing that empty huts nobody is there so these monks were diligent in practicing and he also was rejoicing using rejoice that he has also able to accumulate lot of merits but now everything has gone everything has uh, finished everything become empty now he is talking about this with a kind of a desperate mind sorrowful mind to another celestial being so the other celestial being is aware of this custom so they know that monks gather in a particular dwelling place together only for 3 months to spend the vassa and at the end of the vassa they go away again so they are going to other different places they don't uh, dwell at that same place and they and he this particular deva actually he is aware so he is answering the previous deva with this this uh, verse so this is this is available in the devata samyutta so there he mention magadangata kosalangata ekachyapana vajji bhumiya so that means some have gone to the magad some have gone to the kosala and some have gone to the vajji so those are the uh, ancient cities in uh, in the ancient india and migavya asanga charino aniketa viharanti bikkaro so now he is telling a very beautiful quality migavi asanga charino like the deers going from one forest to another forest without having any kind of an attachment to a particular forest to a particular dwelling place like a group of uh, deers going from one forest to another forest aniketa viharanti bikkavo so these bikkus the disciples of the book buddha they actually dwell without a home without a permanent home now this is actually going against the typical notion that 
typically people are thinking lay people are thinking even the monks are thinking that they need to have a permanent place they need to have a permanent monastery they need to have a permanent temple and for long time till the death they have to reside there but on the opposite this deva and the buddha in certain places mentioned that his disciples are not attached to a particular dwelling place so they should have some sort of freedom in their mind to leave whatever the dwelling place and to a, and to go to another place so if you are staying in a particular place for a long time they you start to bind up with a lot of uh, say burdens a lot of responsibilities so that can sometimes become uh, harmful to your practice so you have to attend to various things so same approach is there or same theme is mentioned in the next verse and we take this verse as well so there it is mentioned amantana hoti sahaya manji vase thane gamane charikaya anabichitam sevitam prikkamano eko chare kagga visana kappu this is also a very beautiful verse amantana hoti sahaya manji so this is something that we all experience what it tells is you are being addressed at any different places many different places suppose you are the father or you are the mother suppose you have many children and while walking you are being addressed and while sitting you are being addressed while traveling you are being addressed suppose you are reading a book you are being addressed while sleeping again you are being awakened to attend to something say while at the office you are giving a call nowadays we have all these various gadgets so that you can't have a peace of mind so you never know when you are giving getting a whatsapp message when you are giving getting a viber message when you are giving getting i don't know when you are getting facebook message when you are getting uh, some email when you are getting a phone call so many many messages are there many many addressing techniques are there and you never have peace of mind because every time people are bugging you every time people are disturbing you and you are keeping your handphone with you and you never know when it is going to ring you never know when it is going to have a new message new email so when the office is asking you to come when your wife is asking you to come when your children are asking you to come when your husband is asking you to come when your friends are asking you to come so this particular king he also a king so he is called brahmadatta and he is with a soft mind so the person who actually recognized this uh, issue so he is called king brahmadatta he is a soft character so being a soft character he actually listen to many people so many actually consider him like a mother that always uh, is approachable so many are approaching him and he, they are asking many questions so please give me this solution please give me that solution please give me an increment please give me a particular village please give me a promotion so being the king now many are asking 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 many things are there now even today the governments are facing the same thing say so assume that you are a minister you are the president you are the ceo so many are asking 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 and you don't have peace of mind because while traveling people are calling while sitting people are calling and while taking the rest people are calling while taking your dinner people are calling while taking your other meals people are calling and even while at the toilet maybe people are calling so this is the situation so amantana hoti sahaya manje vase thane gamane charikay one is addressed in the midst of companions with the resting standing going or travel अनभिचिता 
by being addressed like this, always bugging, always addressing, always called, always a chat message, always a message. So I am combining this with today's situation. So this disturbance, this particular thing understood as a burn. So actually he understood this and he actually given up the kingship and he became a monk. But still ministers still want to have more region because you know when the king leaves the palace so all other are now fighting to get the large part. They want to get the best part. They want to get the higher region. So they are again quarreling. So the king was further sort of uh, disenchanted by seeing these people's greediness because even if you give something to the people, still they are not happy. Even today, if you look at Sri Lankan situation, so one group is asking an increment. Say to nowadays, nurses are strike. Now the PHIs are going to strike. Doctors are threatening that they are going to strike. So all are asking, 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 but they don't know, they don't much care about their duties. They are always asking, asking, asking. So whoever doing the government, so they have to always listen to all these grievances, all these requests. So many are asking. So when you are satisfying one group, another group is not happy. Now they start to quarrel. They start to strike. So they are also asking. So and then you satisfy them, another group start to ask. This is a kind of a continuous ongoing process. Now this king recognized that. And he become disgusted about this greedy nature of the people. They can never be satisfied. Even if you give a lot of money, even if you give a lot of increment, even if you give your attention to them, still they are not satisfied. So they are never going to satisfy. So this particular king, so he very well understood this greedy nature of the human mind. So reflecting that, that, that these people can never be satisfied, so he become sort of dispassionate about this kingship. So then he totally given up the kingship. He actually became a monk. And then he reflecting this uh, greediness, this craving prevailing in the, or predominant in the human mind. So he actually developed vipassana and he attained Pacheka Buddhahood. So both actually verses are fairly going very much closer theme. In the first one, actually, one has seen that the by being uh, attached to something and having many responsibilities, then one has lost his freedom to travel freely, that you are bound to many things. So you don't have a, a freedom to travel as you like. And on the other one, he understood that everywhere you are being bugged, you are being addressed, you are being disturbed. You are being uh, sort of troubled by many, many issues from many, many different people. And it may be your relatives, it may be your children, it may be your wife, husband, friends, and uh, your colleagues, and whoever the other professionals who are talking with you, dealing with you, and your customers, whoever it is. And you are being always disturbed because of this addressing. So both scenarios are showing what are the difficulties that one may having when he is looking or searching for a seclusion? Because having kind of a solitude is something that all of us are needed. Kind of a peace of mind. Time to time having some sort of a seclusion so that we can have a good introspection. One can have a good understanding about one's own situation. One may have some understanding about one's mentality. How, that, how my mind is working now. And in order to do that, you need some amount of seclusion. While the others are always troubling you, you can't do it. So this is where this particular verses, so it is mentioned, Eko Chare Kagga Visana Kapu. So one seeing the peril in this association, so now you are trying to live alone. You are trying to live a kind of a solitude. You are trying to live kind of a, uh, say, solitary life. So this is the theme and the two verses that I picked today. And with that, 
I like to conclude today's Tamil sermon. Now I open the session for questions. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Currently, there are seven questions. One second. Question number one, uh, general question. Dear Bante, last year I had a very consistent practice and quite pleased with the progress and practical understanding I gained under your guidance. Unfortunately, during the last five to six months, my mindfulness practice was minimal due to various reasons. However, I haven't lost the touch and tried to connect to this program and practice at least once a week. I'm determined to practice during the weekdays as well and to adopt a regular timetable. What is Bhante's advice for us to get through this type of ad hoc practice uh, or low p- period? With Metta, that's the end of the question. Yeah, actually, today's uh, <laughs> Dhamma sermon actually gives you some insight because when you have many responsibilities, when you have sort of uh, many, uh, say, other issues, so you face this uh, problem. So you have many things. And every time, uh, so you are actually trying to deal with a lot of other activities so that it is difficult for you to uh, continue your practice. So it is kind of a burden so that actually uh, you are sometimes neglecting your practice. So again, so you come to the root, you come to the zero level. So you have to restart. No other option. So... So this is something that we all sometimes face. So without continuous practice, it's very difficult to uh, maintain some amount of clarity or some amount of steady steadiness in the mind. Because if this all the qualities that we are trying to develop are easily slip from the mind. Unlike the unwholesome qualities, all the wholesome qualities require a certain amount of uh, effort to maintain. So if you are discussing Samma Vayama, the fourth aspect of Samma Vayama is called the sustaining of the good qualities that you are developed. Assume that with your effort that you have, you are able to develop a fair amount of uh, good qualities. But if you are not continuing your practice, so those qualities start to fade away. So those start to um, deteriorate. And now again, when you are starting, you understood, okay, everything has gone. I have to restart. Maybe start from the beginning. So that is where we need to have some sort of a formal practice, daily practice. So irrespective of you have a lot of responsibilities, try to get a maybe early in the morning, just before the, uh, say, uh, going to the, say, washroom, say, have a kind of a little walking path. Or after having a wash, just going for a walking, just doing for a sitting uh, practice. So likewise, we need to find out uh, ways and means how to maintain our practice. So otherwise, it's very difficult. Uh, What we are able to experience start to fade away. Yeah. Question number two of seven. General question. Dear Venerable Bhante. This is a Dhamma question Regards in regards to faith and trust. Would you please be able to explain the meaning of Okapana Shraddha, please? Much merits and appreciation with Metta. That's the end. Yeah, Okapana Shraddha, I think as far as I can remember, now typically what we have uh, is called at the beginning, what we have is not a really a good faith based on the uh, facts. So we simply have some sort of a faith. We simply have some kind of a faith which is not actually factual but because that we being Buddhist we have some sort of faith on the Buddha. We being Buddhist we may have some sort of a faith on the Dhamma to the Sangha but it is not factual because we ourselves have not experienced anything. But later, and this is sometimes called Amulika Sadda, where the faith is a kind of a mere faith, which is not strong and which is fragile and which is kind of a, uh, just kind of a belief. But later, the difference in the Buddha's teaching is that you can actually verify this teaching. So there is a 
path mentioned to practice and accordingly that assume that you are practicing and as you are practicing you yourself start to experience the buddha's teaching so now the confidence is growing now the trust is going now the faith is growing and now it is no more a blind belief now it becomes what you call akaravati sadha where the uh, faith becomes out of a conviction where you are having a very good understanding through that understanding you get a lot of faith on the buddha that he has properly mentioned the dhamma and he has well explained the dhamma it is really beautiful in the middle sorry beautiful in the beginning beautiful in the middle beautiful in the end so you have that very uh, say factual faith while when you start your own practice and that faith actually growing and uh, there it is called akaravati sadha and it is also called okappana sadha and uh, that is in a way kind of an unwavering kind of a faith because you yourself know it is not kind of a blind faith it is not that you are blindly believe rather you yourself have experience it now you have your own experiential knowledge and which is quite telling with the buddha's teaching so therefore it is called okappana sadha yeah question number 3 of 7 mindful sitting dear swami nanda my sitting practice is mindfulness on breath and thank you for this program and your guidance throughout this time during the sitting practice i often come to a point where the breath becomes subtle and disappears to a widespread awareness we have been discussing this from the very first sutta on apanasati 16 steps and in many question and answers sometimes the breath appears back and sometimes the focus shifts to various body sensations or to appearing and disappearing of thoughts when the breath or any other observation disappears when i inquire about the state of my mind seems like the disappearing seems like uh seems it's like this is disappearing or becoming a uh, subtle nature my attitude seems to be that i'm waiting or looking towards this state during um this anavadya question and answer sessions I've heard that most venerable dhamma jiva mahatera are asking this crucial question when the breath disappears whether we like it or dislike it what is the significance of this inquiry and how do we clarify and understand our experience with metta that's the end of the question yeah actually if you are practicing uh, 16 steps of anapanasati once the breath disappears you simply have to maintain your attention closer to the nostril you are not it is not necessary to uh, change the place rather you keep your attention uh, closer to the nostril and uh, as you are keeping it further so there are various uh, sensations starts to automatically develop in the body and uh, that may be kind of a tingling sensation it may be some sort of uh, goosebumps or it may be kind of rupturous uh, sensations pleasurable sit pleasurable feelings so that that kind of various feelings start to appear so it's a kind of a natural evolvement of the practice basically you don't need to purposely do anything but the practice itself is bringing you to some that kind of a experience so it naturally may happen so that is where buddha mentioned piti parisangedi asasi samiti sikkati sukha parisangedi asasi samiti sikkati where you don't need to do any particular thing with the breath rather now the breath actually have actually helped you to refine your attention refine your mindfulness to have a concentrated mind and when you are able to develop your concentration to a particular extent and the breath completely calms down it disappeared and now those sensations start to appear automatically now you are in that the vedana upasana section piti parisangedi sukha parisangedi we are now you can look at all these pleasurable feelings objectively without attaching to them rather you are looking at them like a third person outsider and you are practicing in a way the vedana vedana upasana now sometimes actually this doesn't happen to certain people 
So some actually can naturally grow in this path. And that is, we can say as the Anapanasati oriented practice. So you don't need to jump to any other practice. You can simply continue your practice based on Anapanasati. But to certain other practitioners, so this, this evolvement or this natural uh, manifestation does not happen. So they may sometimes stay it in the breath for long, long time, but there is no any progress. For them, actually, we can turn the yogi to the, what you call the dhatumanasikara, element meditation, because you already gain uh, some amount of, uh, say, concentration through the breath practice. And that practice actually can be used to observe various sensations, various touching points uh, already available in the body and using which you can turn your attention to the element characteristics available in the body and you now can practice Dhatu Manasikara. Yeah. Question number four of ten, general question. Bante, I have learned mindfulness practice under your guidance. Thank you for the valuable service. I'm trying to teach my children the same encourage, and encourage them to practice with me. Many times I've heard that children excel in mindfulness practice better than adults. Can Bhante explain what areas they are better off? From my own practice, I could broadly divide the scope of practice to three parts. Uh, observations, one-pointedness or mind distractions, and reflecting and reflection and understanding. I would like to try to understand if my 12-year-old is better in all these areas or specifically in one, um, in general because of the age, so that, can, so that I can minimize my guidance in those areas. With Metta, that's the end of the question. <laughs> you are trying to put me in trouble. Now, say actually the young ones, uh, only thing is that uh, uh, because of their young age, for this, it may be a little difficult for them to develop certain amount of uh, concentration because in order to develop some amount of concentration, you need a fair amount of restraint. But on the other hand, they can develop mindfulness if they are enthusiastic about it. And the mindfulness development is quite, uh, say, interesting. Assume that particularly in the walking meditation, if they are properly guided, they may start to enjoy walking meditation. Uh, rather than sitting, they may sometimes find walking meditation is quite interesting. And once they are able to recognize mindfulness, that can bring to uh, sitting practice. And they now can probably start, say, mindful breathing, rising and falling, or starting to recognize various sensations available throughout the body and keeping attention to the various postures, posture junctions, all these things. And the beauty is now if they are able to continue this, they can easily have a very, uh, say, clear mind, unlike ourselves. So our minds, adults' minds are fairly, say, corrupted, fairly, uh, say, congested, fairly polluted with so many things. So, so for us, it may take fairly long time for us to calm down ourselves, to uh, remove all these uh, say um, past experiences from our minds and all the signs sedimented in our minds. So that actually takes a long time. But since the children's minds are yet uh, still fairly pure, so they may not take long time for them to uh, come to such a pure mind, fairly a clear mind, clean mind. So they may achieve it very quickly. But the thing is that since they are not yet convinced about the value of the practice, so they may actually lose it. So they may time to time experience it, but they are not uh, yet fully convinced of the value of their practice. And uh, still since they are say 12 years or something like that, so it's still they are not yet uh, matured enough to understand the Buddha's teaching in a deep way. So the, the physical experience or the experiential knowledge tallying with the Buddha's teaching is not yet uh, satisfactory happens. 
So therefore, they can't understand where they where their mind resides or what they are really experiencing along with the Buddha's teaching. So that way, actually their experience, they don't feel as something worthy. Say for example, assume that your child is experiencing some sort of an emptiness in, the, in his mind, in or her, her mind. Suppose that he went through very quickly to that level and you also understood his concentration is not that good, but he was maintaining a very good of uh, mindfulness and he is also experiencing some sort of uh, rising and passing away nature, which I am also experiencing. So now he is able to keep his mind empty. So what is the value of this emptiness? Are you able to explain him? Are you able to convince him the value of it? So that is where it is a bit difficult because it is kind of a deep teaching. And if we, if we are able to fully convince him, then actually they can maintain it for further and further. But on the other hand, when it comes to a, an adult, so he actually has experienced the life. He went through a lot of difficulties. He went through a lot of, uh, say, ups and downs of the life. And he recognized the value of the Dhamma. He was quite convinced about the Dhamma. And now he is trying to experience it. Now he is trying to uh, experience it by himself. Now he is practicing. Now time to time he also gets certain understanding, certain insights. And those insights now can easily tally with the Buddha's teaching because he is now an adult, a mature person and already somewhat convinced about the Dhamma and uh, therefore when he is gaining some sort of a result, so that result can be easily maintained I can't say it is easy but you are you are you, you feel the value of it you can actually tally your experience with the Buddha's teaching and someone may even guide you that uh, this is where you are and uh, this is the value of it and this is this has to further develop or something like that so you may get uh, further convincing uh, advice that the value of your experience is something that you need to maintain, something that you need to further improve. So this is the, these are the areas that we can recognize when we are comparing the adults practice and the children's practice. So the children, though they are able to quickly get results, so if they are not maintaining it, so they again... Uh, replace it with many other things. So they are learning a lot of other things. They are going to the school or they are through the distant learning. They are learning a lot of things and their mind now forgets their, this experience, what they gained through the mindfulness practice and they replace that experience with the lot of incoming knowledge, what we call the knowledge, the, the, the subject knowledge. And they are again corrupt in their mind. So, so if you are able to advise your child to maintain that quality mind, maintain that pure mind, and you encourage that, and you try to convince him the value of it, it doesn't mean that you are uh, not teaching the other worldly subjects. So you may teach him, true. But at the same time, giving some opportunity for him to maintain what he has gained and slowly, uh, say, paving the way to uh, sort of understand the Buddha's teaching so that he may slowly understand the value of his level of uh, mind or the experience that he is going through. So then he may not deteriorate. He may not fall down or downfall. Uh, and maybe while when he is becoming an adult, so he has both. So he's he's maintaining the good uh, say experience that he has already achieved. It is not dropped. It is not uh, deteriorated. And at the same time, as an adult, you have your subject knowledge, you have gained your education, and that is also there. So if one can balance these two, I feel that is something quite challenging. And uh, as, an, as a parent, if you can help your child to achieve both goals, 
then that is a really good achievement. Yeah. Question number five of ten. Uh, general question. Dear Bhante, was Maliadeva Mahatera the last known Arahant in Sri Lanka? What are the distinct characteristics uh, if one can identify by associating someone for a long time who claims to be an Arahant? That's the end of the question. Uh, I, I didn't get to uh, Chatu properly. Um, so I'll read it again. Was Maliadeva Mahatera the last known Arahant in Sri Lanka? What are the distinct characteristics if one can identify by associating someone for a long time who claims to be an Arahant? That's the end of the question. Yeah. Mm, actually, some actually uh, certain monks uh, even uh, say that the Sri Lanka is the one who has given such a title that this is the last Arahant. So there is no more future Arahants in Sri Lanka. So this is a kind of a wrong notion. So this is a kind of an argument, certain, uh, say, uh, educated and uh, practice, practice oriented. And even the foreign monks are telling that the Sri Lanka is the only country who has uh, sort of wind up the session. <laughs> so they didn't expect future Arahan, so future whoever the attainments so they have tell, told that, okay, he's the last person and no more. So this is kind of a detrimental attitude may be available in Sri Lanka. And uh, as Bhante, Adidam, uh, Bhante Dhammaji mentioned, so this is something that uh, prevailed uh, maybe till 1950s or something. So, so, so people were thinking now that Buddha era has gone. No more arahants, no more uh, practice, and now only you can uh, accumulate merit. So that is the attitude Sri Lanka basically had. But on the other hand, say Thailand, Burma, they actually continue to practice. So they are actually, there may be arahants, I don't know, but they continue to practice. They didn't consider that the Buddha Sasana has finished. So still something can be gained, still something that they can uh, experience by practicing. So that, that attitude was there in Thailand and Burma. So as a result, so the Burmese masters start to come to Sri Lanka in 1960s, 1950s, like Mahasi Sayado and then the uh, Sayado Upandita. So they actually start to come to Sri Lanka and uh, they start to actually re sort of uh, restart the practicing oriented uh, Buddhism. So at the parallelly, actually, Mataraji Yanarava Mahatero and various other practice-oriented monks, actually, they also tried to develop. It is not they didn't basically think that uh, this uh, already finished sasana, already ended sasana, but rather they felt okay, this is still possible to practice. So now these two traditions uh, get together, and uh, that is how the Protest Protest tradition regained in the 1950s uh, and they started kind of a practice oriented uh, monkhood, practice oriented uh, say uh, culture and that is also now thriving in Sri Lanka and uh, therefore we can't say actually even nowadays Sri Lanka has many arahants probably you might have heard I don't know whether you believe it or not anyway uh, so anyway, we can keep an open mind rather than uh, thinking that uh, it's all gone, all finished. But especially with the Maliyadeva uh, Maharatanvan say is that uh, we can say that uh, I heard that he is the last one who is with this. Uh, you know, when one becomes an arahant, there may be certain other qualifications so other qualities that one can gain even during the buddha's period there are many arahants who didn't have uh, say psychic powers there are many arahants who didn't have what you call the jahana certain direct knowledges say like abhinya says many arahants were there who didn't have pubbe nivasa anusajnana that the recollection of the past life they didn't have and they didn't have the qualification to read others' mind. 
so they didn't, didn't have any capacity to uh, see how other beings are rising and passing from one birth to the other birth so they didn't have the clairvoyance the divine eye so likewise so these are certain special skills that the monks may gain and it may sometimes those skills are there even with the worldly monks not with the arahants so if an arahant have these skills special skills so then he is sometimes called as an arahant with that three types of uh, special skills and this maliya deva maharatan vahan says i heard is such an arahant who had all these skills so it may be true that he may be the last arahant who basically uh, combine all these so arahanthood as well as all that other external uh, skills that what what we are discussing were gained by maliya deva maharatan mahansi maybe other, other arahants later available in sri lanka but don't know and may be available in other countries as well probably uh, not that accomplished but it doesn't mean that the buddha's teaching is now uh, not at the level of practicing so there are buddha has very uh, sort of uh, categorically mentioned that if one is continuing to practice and if one is continuing to develop vipassana if one is continuing to develop sila morality so his sasana is not uh, say his sasana is not empty of the arahants so he actually encourage therefore monks nuns lay people to practice so that he may or whoever practicing diligently may be able to experience his teaching so that is where actually we have to follow question number 6 of 10 general question there on sana venerable bante i thought for all this time when i meditate i'm mindful about the objective when i really feel that and not thinking about any other thing i have these questions number 1 are we mindful when we don't think i mean when we feel the objective and really don't think about any other thing at the same time are we mindful number 2 even if we think about some other thing does the mindfulness break uh, number 3 does this state called not thinking mean mindfulness all the time thank you that's the end of the question yeah we can uh, answer like this now basically if you are knowingly thinking then we can say you are mindfully thinking suppose you are you want to think about the past you have to learn about the past you need to reflect about the past but you know very well now i am thinking about the past and uh, while thinking also you understand that you know that i am thinking i am thinking about the past i am remembering something about happened in the past so that way you are well established in the present moment and you know very well what the mind is doing similarly assume that you need to design something you need to plan something which is uh, actually the mind oriented and you mentally do it you project it you uh, sort of uh, uh, say think about it plan about it yet you are established very well in the present moment and you know very well now i am planning so this way you can think while being mindful assume now you you don't want to think now you have finished your job now you should be able to calm down the mind now you are not thinking now you are not driven by anything you are now you are not driven by past remembering you are not driven by any future uh, say designing planning because you have finished it now your ambition now your desire is to keep yourself quiet assume now you are able to do it because no point of thinking right now that that is not necessary so you are able to keep your mind calm now no thoughts in the mind so this is what buddha appreciated now if you refer uh, a sutta called uh, uh, vitakka santhana sutta available in the majjhima nikaya 
very beautifully buddha mentioned this so buddha mentioned whenever you want to think you are thinking whenever you want not to think you are not thinking suppose you have eyes now using your eyes now you can watch something and now you are seeing you are using your eyes now you are seeing suppose now you you read a book and you have seen the content and now you want to finish it now you want to keep the book away and now you want to close your eyes now nothing is seen now you have close your eyes now you are so in the eye faculty you have this controllability so you when it is necessary you are looking using your eyes and when it is not necessary you are keeping your eyes closed at that time nothing is there and your eyes are closed not function now similarly can you do the same thing for your mind when it is necessary you are using your mind faculty to think about something useful and when it is not necessary you are keeping your mind quiet quite silent so the thoughts are not an essential part of the mind so this is something uh, that we need to understand so we typically have the uh, kind of a uh, typically have kind of a traditional uh, belief that the mind means thinking but on the opposite there is a mind free from thinking that is where buddha mentioned that there is a samadhi for example which is with vitakka and vichara which has kind of a activation in the mind again and again applying the mind to a particular object so this is kind of a, a little disturbance in the mind but then buddha mentioned there is a samadhi which is free from this applied mind so mind is quite stable and mind stay quite focused on a particular place and it is quite uh, stable it is rigid in a way it is uh, un- unwavering quite stable so it doesn't necessary to have any thought at all does it mean that your mind loses the investigative quality what do you think suppose you are observing something through a microscope and you are keeping it under the lens and uh, and do you really need to have kind of a disturbance in order to experience it to investigate it or when you have a very quiet silent but kind with a very investigative approach that you can do the experiment or this use of the microscope i think the second approach is the best so that is why i would mention so while you do your practice slowly you may come to this second level where you are maintaining a very quiet mind which is free from thinking but have a very good vigilance have a investigative approach the mind has some sort of a curiosity at that time actually the possibility is there for various insights the personal knowledge so mindfulness is in a very higher state at that level so the mind is quite awakened at that time so if you are thinking that the thoughts are not there so you are not mindful so it is a wrong wrong idea yeah uh and then we actually have maybe four more questions is it okay uh, if we go over time uh we we'll take one maybe then okay one all right um this is a quick watch uh question number 7 uh general question dear bante the special practices mentioned during the dhamma talk uh do do tanga by practicing monks are these to tackle deeply rooted tendencies for anusaya that's the end yeah we can say in some sense so buddha mentioned actually dutanga is basically to uh, remove defilements so suppose you feel that uh, you are a greedy character and you honestly understood that you are greedy on to food and uh, so there are you are trying to tame your mind by using a single meal rather than having two meals now as monks so typically they have the breakfast and the lunch 
what you call heal the morning meal and the uh, say before the noon and uh, suppose that one particular monk recognize now he is too much greedy and he want to tame the mind so he may take the one meal practice so likewise so depending on the character depending on your defilements you can select these dutanga practices and uh, that in a way helps to sort of tame the mind to cut off the defilements in a way in a little rigid manner so different approaches are there in the buddha's teaching to so tame the mind so this is one approach yeah so what are the other questions chatu probably we can quickly go through okay all right they're, they're quite small questions okay, okay. uh question number 8 general question i have heard the word uh balava vipassana in dhamma talks could you please explain it with an example uh that's the end of the question so different terms are there actually i need to uh, refresh my mind on those terms because uh, uh in when it come when when it comes to udayavya rising and passing away knowledge the very first level is called tarunu udayavya Yeah, it is not yet uh, mature enough, but when it is growing to high extent, it is called balava the the abhya balava vipassana. So it is uh, gaining or momentum, and uh, there may be certain other distinctions I need to check and see uh, to give you a very precise answer. Question number eight. Um... uh sorry nine um general question dear bante can you please explain the significance of dane after someone has passed away why do we give it seven days three months and a year after pass uh, after a person has passed away much merits for your answer that's the end of the question yeah i think this is kind of a tradition uh, coming with the culture and all these things and there are certain beliefs as well rooted into this and certain incidents also happened during the buddha's time even that uh, sometimes uh, monks are asked to not to distribute belongings of, of a certain deceased monk till seven days are gone so likewise these things may have some sort of a valid uh, ground when it is calling seven days arms giving or three months arms giving but anyway it has become some sort of a tradition and might or might not have strong reasons and on the other hand we can uh, give dane this uh, donations at any given time and you can pass merits to the other person so there is no any restrictions in giving uh, something to another person and uh, you uh, share that merit with anyone else so there is no any restrictions but this has become some sort of a custom in the in sri lanka and maybe in the other buddhist countries question number 10 last one um dear bante based on the dhamma sermon what advice would would we give for someone working in a very busy and high pressure environment for example managing the covid response many of my colleagues in this role are drained from months of working I notice they cannot even smile. I admire their hard work but worry about their well-being. How can they maintain and protect their well-being while on and off the job? With metta that's the end of the question. <laughs> yeah, actually so that is where actually we need to have some time for ourselves. So if we think our job is our life, so then it is a kind of a mistaken belief as far as I can say because uh, actually we need to honestly do our job but still have to maintain limits because you know if we are drained out if we are sort of uh, what you call uh, burned and then uh, then you can't perform well so in order to perform well you need to have clarity of your mind you need to have kind of a refreshness of your mind and then only you can have a, a say a clear picture about what you are going to do and again and again if you are sort of uh, uh, say working hard throughout the day and uh, not taking any break so ultimately you feel exhausted and then you can't you can't work properly and your mind may not give the best results so time to time the mind has to give a proper relaxation 
like we sleep, say we, our body has requires certain relaxation, resting period. So we give that. We try to give that using our sleep. So at least say five six hours sleep is needed. So that is the time the mind and the body get refreshed. So similarly, during your job also you need to have some sort of a breaking time, kind of a vacation. Otherwise, you can't perform well. So therefore, don't think that uh, doing the job seven days. 365 days is the proper approach. Rather, time to time taking a break is useful to you even for the job for your occupation. So that's what I I feel uh, the best approach. Uh, that's the end of the questions today, Bhante. Um, so I just like to wrap up. Um, I'd like to thank Bhante for giving up valuable time for this program and also to pass on our merits. Um, as well as to the people organising and also those seen and on being participating. And lastly, to the participants, because without you, there would be no programme. Teruan Sarnay. Yeah, Teruan Sarnay. Teruan Sarnay.